five-week unit learning about Jesus' teaching. And so we're going to get started. Let's go ahead and put our hands together, bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's pray to begin our lesson, our worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sunday. Many of us have had many adventures, really cool adventures during this week. We went to uh, water parks. We went camping. We uh, returned from a long vacation out of country. Uh, we pray that uh, wherever we've come from as we gather here for this Sunday, that this would be a time for us to focus on you and worshiping you, to thank you for all of the uh, awesome adventures that we have uh, been going on during this summer. Jesus, today we're going to be learning about uh, your teachings and learning about what you taught about God's kingdom. And so we pray th uh, that you would uh, open our ears to be able to listen to you, open our hearts to be able to respond to you so that we can grow in our faith and grow in knowing who you are, God. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, so our word up today is you are the light of the world. Have you guys heard that before? That we're, as followers of Jesus, we are to be the light of the world. Salt of the earth, light of the world. Uh, I think that song might be a little bit based on what we're going to be learning about today. But yeah, we are to be the light of the world. So let's go ahead and say that on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. You are the light of the world. Yeah, we want to be the light of the world for other people and show other people God's love. All right, it is time for praise. So if you're part of praise, you are the light of the world. All right, it is time for our memory verse. And I admit, our memory verse is a little long this week. So we'll probably practice it several weeks because it's a long memory verse. Um, and I'll just, I'll try to make it a little bit easy and we'll practice it and I'll only cover up just a few words uh, before we see who can do our memory verse. All right, so... Before we begin with memory verse, I need a volunteer from each side to be our scorekeepers. You want to be our scorekeeper? All right. And do you guys want to name yourself, or do you just want to be team A and team B today? Team A, team B. Team A, team B. Okay. We're going to keep it simple. Team A and team B. Team A, team A. All right. You guys want a name? All right. What name do you want? Team A. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Team eight. Team Jesus. All right. We're going to be, I'm going to give you guys some, I'm going to give you some more time to think about what names you want to be. For next week, today, today we're going to be Team A and Team B. So Team A, we have our point person. Team B, we need our point person. All right, all the way in the back, in the corner. Will you be our point person? Is that okay? Yep. All right, so we have our point people. All right, we're going to reveal our memory verse now. Our memory verse. Our memory verse. I'm going to read it out loud, and then you guys are going to follow. I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's a little bit long. It's a little bit long. You guys are looking at me like, huh? Don't worry. We're going to practice it over multiple weeks because I know it's a hard one, and I know it's a long one. So we'll just try to do our very best with just a couple of the words. All right? So here is our memory verse. It says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Yeah, it's a hard one, I know. We're going to just try to practice and learn a couple of the words and do the best that we can, and we'll practice it for a couple of weeks for our memory verse. Question. I am working on memorizing it with you guys. <laughs> it's going to take a couple of weeks because I need to practice it also. It is a long one. All right, so let's practice. I'm going to read it all together and try our best on the count of three. Ready, one, two, three. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. First Chronicles 29, 11. All right, I know it's long. 
We need to try our very best, okay? We'll do the best that we can. Let's read it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. First Chronicles 29.11. I guess want to read it one more time before I start covering up some words. This is a little bit long. Let's try it one more time before we start covering up some words. Ready? One, two, three. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. First Chronicles 29.11. All right. We're going to cover up just a couple of words. All right, and we'll try it again. We'll practice it again. Just a few. All right, we're going to read it again. Think you can do this one? Yeah? Okay, here's some confidence. All right, let's go on the count of three. One, two, three. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. First Chronicles 29.11. I've done an awesome job. This memory verse was super hard, and we're going to keep practicing this one a little bit more because it's so hard. Let's go ahead and read it on the count of three all together. You almost got it. Yeah. All right, all together on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. First Chronicles 29.11. All right, great job. All right, all together, our word up is? All right, good job. You are the light of the world. We're going to start a new big picture question this week. And this is going to be our question for the next five weeks that we're going to be asking. So you're getting get very familiar with it. Here is our question. What did Jesus teach when he was on earth? What did Jesus teach when he was on earth? Because we're looking at Jesus' teaching, so it's important for us to know what did Jesus teach about while he was on the earth. If you think you know and you want to give an answer, you go ahead and raise your hand. What do you think? What do you think, John? Okay, so Jesus taught about his wisdom. Okay, what else? What did Jesus teach about? Stuff. That is, that is very broad and technically true. More specifically, though, what did Jesus teach about? About faith. About faith. Okay, good. What did Jesus teach about? About God. Okay, what did Jesus teach about? Okay, it's about who God is. Yeah, how they can have eternal life. Good. All right, here's the answer to our question. You guys all kind of got little pieces of the answer, so we're going to put them all together, and here's our answer. What did Jesus teach when he was on earth? Jesus taught about God. Jesus taught about God's kingdom. And Jesus taught that all scripture, all of the Bible, is about him because Jesus is God's son. All right, one more time, our word up. Okay, I heard like three people really loud, and everybody else was kind of like, what? So let's go try it all together. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> all right, good job. We're gonna so today we're going to be learning about Jesus' teaching, and we're going to learn that Jesus taught about character. Now, we've spent the last five weeks looking at Jesus' miracles, right? And we learn that Jesus' miracles, what do they prove about Jesus when we saw his miracles? Jesus' miracles prove what? Okay, that God is real, but not just that God is real, right? It proves that, who is Jesus? Yeah, so he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, right? So we learned that Jesus' miracles prove that he is the Son of God because Boys, Jesus' miracles prove that he is the Son of God. Now, starting this week, we're going to be beginning a new unit for five weeks where we're going to be looking at the teachings of Jesus. Now, 
Why do you think that it's important that we listen and learn from what Jesus taught? Why do you think it's important that we listen and learn from what Jesus taught? Let me put it this way. We know that Jesus is God's son because we just learned that, right? So if Jesus is God's son, why is it important that we listen to what Jesus has to say if Jesus is God's son? All right, boys, I'm taking 50 points away from Team A because you guys are continuously talking. So please take 50 points away from Team A. Right, because you guys are talking. Let me listen. All right, so let me ask this one more time, right? So we know that Jesus is God's son. Why do you think it's important that we listen to him teaching and learn from what Jesus taught? Why do you think it's important? Well, one reason. Okay, Chloe, what do you think? So we know how to look. Yeah, that's exactly right. One reason is that since Jesus is God's son, Jesus has seen God and knows what God is like, right? We haven't been able to see God because God is spirit, and we haven't been to heaven, but Jesus has, and so Jesus can teach us all about God. In fact, when Jesus taught, the Bible tells us that when Jesus taught, the people that listened were amazed because Jesus taught with real authority. Jesus revealed what God's kingdom is like, so it's important for us to listen because Jesus is the only one who knows what God's kingdom is like. It's f important for us to listen so that we can know what God is like as well. Now, this weekend, boys, this week, we're going to look at a lesson that Jesus taught his disciples. Soon after Jesus had called his first disciples, he began to teach and preach. Caius, I see your back of your head. Can I show you? Then I'm going to move you up here so you're not distracted. So move up one row, please, so that their hands can't reach you, that you're not distracted by other people. So this week, we're going to be lo uh, looking at a lesson that Jesus taught his disciples. And soon after Jesus called his first disciples, he began to teach and preach in the synagogues. And people from all over came to listen to what Jesus had to say, because as we mentioned earlier, Jesus taught with authority. Now, one day, Jesus saw the crowd, and people from all over came to listen to him, and so he went up with his disciples to the mountainside, and he wanted to teach his disciples about God's kingdom and about the people who would be able to enter into God's kingdom and what they're like. And so Jesus went up to the mountain to teach, and as he began to teach about God's kingdom, he gave a lesson which is known in the Bible as the Sermon on the Mount. Can you guys say that after me? Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, right? Why? Because Jesus taught and he was on the mountain. So Sermon on the Mountain, right? This Sermon on the Mount can be found in your Bibles, and it's kind of a large section of your Bible. It's Matthew chapter 5 all the way to the end of Matthew chapter 7. Now, don't worry. We're not going to cover the entire thing today because it's way too long to do in one week. We're only going to be looking at a small part of Jesus' lesson today. We're going to be focusing on 16 verses, right, and the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, before we look at Jesus' message itself and what he had taught, it's important for us to understand who Jesus was teaching to, right, and who Jesus' audience was. Now, when the crowds gathered around Jesus, there were three main groups of people, types of people that came to listen to him. And if you picture these groups, imagine these groups as a circle around Jesus, right? There would be three groups, the smaller circle, a bigger circle around it, and then a much bigger circle that's even farther around Jesus. And each of these groups of people expected different things when they came to listen to Jesus talk. The first group of people who we're going to learn Jesus primarily talked to today were the 12 disciples, right? These 12 disciples were men who were picked by Jesus to be future leaders of the church. They were the ones who Jesus spent most of his time teaching, and Jesus expected them to mimic him and be like him. In fact, Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to teach the same message that Jesus taught and also to be able to perform the same miracles that Jesus was able to perform so that they could help teach other people about God's kingdom. The second group of people that came to listen to Jesus were other followers of Jesus who were not the 12 disciples. 
They were still serious followers of Jesus, and they came to listen and learn from Jesus and wanted their lives to be changed by Jesus, right? These might have been the people who uh, saw some of the miracles that Jesus performed. They might have been the people who uh, were healed by Jesus. A group of these people were the women who followed Jesus, and they actually uh, supported him with money so that he was able to do his ministry on earth. And this is other people who would eventually become members of the early church. Now, the last group of people who were curious about Jesus, these were people who gathered around because they saw something different about Jesus. They wanted to go where everybody else was because everybody else was going to see Jesus. They might have come because they were curious, or they might have come because they wanted to be entertained by seeing something amazing. They, these are the people who came to Jesus and said, I want to see a miracle. I want to see something amazing happen, right? Like, as if they were watching a TV show, they wanted to be entertained by Jesus, but they didn't really want to follow him. Others listened and waited for a chance to criticize Jesus or to try to prove him wrong about something. So a lot of the religious leaders when they came to listen. They didn't listen to learn from Jesus. They listened to try to point out something that Jesus was doing wrong, right? Not to learn. Now, as we look and learn about Jesus' teaching, I'm hoping that we're going to be one of those first two groups, like the 12 disciples or Jesus' followers, because they were eager to learn from Jesus. They knew that Jesus was the Son of God and that his lessons applied to their lives and applies to our lives so that we can live pleasing to God. Jesus began the Sermon of the Mount by giving eight different characteristics of a person who belongs in God's kingdom. Now, we're going to be focusing today on a person's character. So it's important for us to understand what does that mean? What is character? What is character for a person? Can you describe it? Their personality? Okay, good. What else? Who else has something to expand on that? Character is personality. What else? What is character? What is a person's character? Anybody? Well, I looked this up in the dictionary to find out. And character is the way that a person thinks, feels, and behaves, right? So, like their personality. Why do you think our character is important? Why do you think our character is important? Why do you think our character is important? Okay, <laughs> if we have a bad character, we might not be able to go to heaven. That is true, right? Well, our character is important because it makes up who we are and defines how we treat other people, right? Have you ever met somebody and you can tell because of their character, the way they interact with other peop people, if they're good or bad? Maybe you know somebody at school who is very selfish and they only want everything for themselves and they make everything about themselves. Do they have good character or bad character? Good character, right? Have you ever had somebody that's super nice to other people or is always saying thank you to them if, so something if somebody gives them something? Do they have good character or bad character if they're polite to others? They have good character. Yeah, some sometimes people deliberately try to make us mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes we get really mad, right, when somebody else has a bad character or deliberately tries to get us in trouble, right? Now, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lists eight characteristics. How many did, how many did he list? Eight. Eight characteristics of people who are blessed in God's kingdom. Right? And these characteristics, they might be different than we initially think when we think of people who are blessed. Right? So from a worldly point of view, we might be like, oh, somebody who is rich, they're blessed because they have lots of money. Right? Maybe uh, somebody who's famous is blessed because uh, they're very popular. Or maybe somebody who's really beautiful, they're blessed because people like them and they're, they look good. Right? But that's not what Jesus said about character about the character of people who are blessed in God's kingdom. In fact, if we look at people who are blessed in God's kingdom, we might think, wait a second, 
that doesn't seem like it's very blessed. So we're going to go through these eight characteristics, and these eight characteristics are also known as the Beatitudes. Can you guess it after me? Beatitudes. Yep. And these show what type of character that God looks for in people. And so the first three of these characteristics, they deal with what's in a person's heart. Right, what's in their heart? And this is what Jesus says. Right? He said, blessed are those who are spiritually needy. And this is what we're going to be focusing on most of today, the Beatitudes. Right? Blessed are those who are spiritually needy. Some translations say, uh, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Right? Now, does it seem like a blessing to be poor in your spirit? Does it seem like a blessing to be poor in anything? You think that seems like a bad idea, right? Why do you think Jesus said, blessed are those who are spiritually needy or who are poor in spirit? Why do you think that's, being, that's blessed in God's kingdom? All right, well, let me explain this a little bit, right? Because you guys are looking at me really confused. Jesus knew that those who are spiritually needy realize that they cannot be righteous on their own. They cannot be made right with God on their own, right? Think of the opposite, right? Think of people who are spiritually rich, right? An example of this might be the Pharisees, right? They thought that because they behaved a certain way, right, that they were automatically right with God. Were they right with God? No, C right? Because God says that we have to be perfect to be able to go to heaven. And so the Pharisees looked down on other people because they were spiritually rich. They thought they were doing all of these right things. People who are poor in spirit, they realize that they need a savior, that they need help, right? That they can't be righteous on their own. And so they're looking for a savior, and Jesus said that those who are spiritually needy are blessed because they're more likely to rely on Jesus as their savior. And when they rely on Jesus as their savior, right, then they will be able to go to heaven because Jesus has died for our sins. In fact, Jesus taught that he had come to fulfill all of God's law. He didn't just get rid of it, right? That he had come to fulfill God's law. And Jesus did that by living a perfect life, by dying on the cross, and then taking the punishment for our sins, and then being raised from the dead. Those who trust in Jesus are blessed because they will get to go to heaven, not because they did super good at everything, but because they believed in Jesus as their Savior. So Jesus said, blessed are those who are spiritually needy, who come to Jesus needing a Savior. Blessed are those who are sad, Jesus said next. And now, now you're like, that doesn't seem, I don't want to be sad, right? Now, Jesus doesn't mean the people who are just like, I'm super sad all the time, everything's terrible. That's not what Jesus is talking about here, right? Jesus knew that people who realize the weight of their sins and they're sad over their sins that they would react with sadness over what they had done. How many of you guys have ever gotten in trouble for something and you knew it was your fault and you did wrong? Anybody? How do you feel, right, when somebody says, oh, you did this really bad, you treated this person really bad? Do you feel happy about that? Or do you feel sad about that? Yeah, sad, maybe angry at yourself, disappointed in yourself, right? Jesus said that those who are sad over their sins and not living up to the God's expectations, they can experience the joy of knowing God's forgiveness, right? When we experience comfort from God, knowing that God loves us so much that he's forgiven us, even when we mess up, even when we sin. Blessed are those who are free of pride. Now, some translations say those who are humble or those who are meek. You guys know that word meek? Meek, not unique, meek. Now, it's important to know that meek doesn't mean like a person is just weak. They're not, a w they're not wimpy, right? That's not what Jesus is saying here, right? Instead, it means people, people who are meek are people who have their strength under control, right? Even if they're strong, they don't act like they're strong. To put it another way, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who are willing to respond to God's training and God's instruction. That they don't think they're strong enough to do everything, but they rely on God. When we put our trust in Jesus as Savior, Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit as our helper. And the Holy Spirit helps train us so that we can live lives pleasing to God. Those who respond to God's training are blessed because they will experience the reward of God's kingdom. 
Now, I know this is, we're, g- we're going through each one of them, and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much to, to learn. There is a lot, right? That's why we're focusing on these ones specifically. The fourth characteristic deals with our relationship with God. Jesus said, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for what is right. Why do you think it's important why do you think it's important for us to long for what is right or what is righteous? Anybody want to take a guess? Why do you think it's important for us to long for what is right? Hmm. Yep. Well, what Jesus says is those who long for righteousness, they want justice for things that are wrong in the world, right? They're not happy knowing that there's evil in this world, that our world has been corrupted by sin. And their happiness comes from the fact that God promises to one day make everything right, right? God promises to make us perfect and never sin again. It's not going to happen here on earth, right? The Holy Spirit's going to keep working on us. But when we get to heaven, right, we'll be perfect and never sin again. God promises that his kingdom will be without sin, without pain, without suffering. Now, these last four characteristics we're going to look at, we're going to go through a little bit faster. These are characteristics of how people treat one another, right? So the first three were what's in our hearts. The fourth one was our relationship with God and relying on God to make everything right in the future. And the last four deal with how we treat each other. And this is what Jesus says. He says, blessed are those who show mercy. Why do you think it's important to show mercy? Anybody want to take a guess? Why do you think it's important to show mercy? Mercy is uh, not giving people what they deserve, right? So if somebody, if somebody comes up to you and hits you really hard, they deserve to be hit back, right? But you can show them mercy by not hitting them back, right? So why is it important that we show mercy to other people? What do you think? Nobody gives you mercy? <laughs> If you don't show mercy? Oh. Yeah, if you don't show mercy, then your heart can be hard towards other people. Right? Well, here's, here's why. Oh, oh, here's another question. Who should we show mercy to? Sh- should we show mercy to people we like? Should we show mercy to people we don't like? Should we show mercy to everyone? To everyone, yeah. So, Jesus said, Right? That the servants of God must reflect the heart of God. And God is love and God is merciful. Right? God shows mercy to people who don't deserve it. Right? The Bible says that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, right, Jesus died for us. Jesus showed us mercy and forgiveness. Right? Just the same way that God shows mercy to people who don't deserve it, we need to show mercy to other people too. In fact, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us to be kind to other people, right? If someone is mean to you, it means showing mercy means don't be mean back to them, right? And then Jesus says that those who show mercy will experience God's mercy. The reason that we show mercy and forgiveness to other people is because God has forgiven us of so much. Blessed are those whose heart is pure, Jesus said. Those who are of pure heart will see God in two different ways. First of all, A pure heart is what's needed to be able to understand the heart of God because God's heart is pure. Second of all, a person with a pure heart will be able to enter to heaven one day and to be with God forever. Blessed are those who make peace, Jesus said. Now this is important. Where do you think think it starts to be a peacemaker? Do you need to rely on somebody else to start being a peacemaker? Do you need to rely on yourself to start being a peacemaker? What do you think? Pointing to your head? Yeah. Being a peacemaker starts internally. It starts with us, right? Being a peacemaker is means that we love other people. And being a peacemaker is a choice that we make, right? Even if we don't feel like it, right, it's a choice that we make. We can choose not to start an argument with uh, somebody else. We can choose that if somebody tries to start a fight with us or tries to start an argument with us, we can choose not to respond in the same way. 
In fact, Jesus said, love your enemy, pray for those that hurt you. Right? And now Jesus set the ultimate example of what it is to be a peacemaker. While Jesus was being crucified to on the cross, people mocked him and they insulted him and they spit on him and they hit him. And instead of getting even with them, right, instead of praying, God, will you smash these people because they're mean to me, right, Jesus prayed to God to forgive them. He understood that they didn't fully understand how terrible they were being to Jesus, right? They didn't fully understand what they were doing to Jesus. And being a peacemaker is important because God's kingdom is characterized by peace. God's kingdom will be a place of peace. Finally, Jesus said, blessed are those who suffer for doing what is right. Now, I want to make a distinction here, right? Jesus makes a distinction between suffering because we make a bad choice and suffering for doing what is right. So, for example, if I decide to make a really bad choice, let's say I just say, decide to take all my money and throw it away, and then I'm poor, and I'm suffering because I'm poor, and that's a bad choice, Right? Jesus says, doesn't say I'm blessed, right? If I decide, hey, I'm going to go run across the freeway, right, and I get hit by a car and I'm suffering in the hospital because I got hit by a car, right, Jesus is not saying I'm blessed because I made a bad choice. What Jesus is saying is blessed are those who suffer for doing what is right. Now, Jesus warned his disciples, and this is important for us to know, because I think a lot of times we think, okay, if we follow God, if we listen to Jesus, if we listen to all of these things, if we develop character that is honoring to God, that everything will go easy for us. And the Bible tells us that's actually not true, right? That uh, Jesus warned his disciples that following him would not be easy. People would make fun of the disciples, spread lies about them. People would persecute them and even kill them for being followers of Jesus. However, Jesus said that those who suffer for believing in him and f continuing to follow him, that they would receive a great reward in heaven and they will experience God's blessing. Now, after explaining the characteristics of those who follow Jesus, Jesus gave two final examples on how Christians are to behave, right? And so this is what Jesus says. He said, Christians are to be the salt and light of the earth, right? That means that Christians are supposed to be examples to others on how God wants us to live our lives. Now, we're going to look at each of these very quickly, right, because we don't have too much time left, right? We're going to look at salt first. Now, salt has two main purposes for food. First of all, salt makes food taste better. Have you ever got, had french fries and there's no salt on them and you're just like, ugh, yuck. They're, they're not good, right? But then you put salt on the french fries and you're like, oh, these are amazing, right? Salt makes food taste better. It's just potato. Yeah, it's just not good, right? Salt makes food taste better, right? Followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus are to improve the world through their actions, just like salt makes food better, we're supposed to make other people's lives better in the way that we live, to love other people. The second thing that salt does is salt helps preserve food. A long time ago, before there were refrigerators, people would use salt to prevent food from becoming moldy and being corrupted and being spoiled. In fact, how many of you guys have had beef, uh, beef jerky? Right? Beef jerky is an example of meat that is preserved because of salt. Similarly, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to help prevent the world become, uh, from becoming corrupted by doing what is right in God's eyes. In fact, Jesus told his followers, and we saw this in our video, he said, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I heard somebody when we were watching our video saying, I can't be perfect, right? It's impossible to be perfect. Nobody's perfect except Jesus, right? We are to try our best to be like God, to be perfect, even if we don't measure up to that standard, we try our best. Jesus also taught us to be the light of the world. Right? Just like our word up says, you are the light of the world. Now, a light's not hidden away. Have you ever 
tried to turn on a light in like a room and it was like hidden under something or look for a light and it's hidden under something you can't see anything is it useful no because you can't see anything a light is supposed to reveal and shine so that other people can see uh what's going on right so believers need to share their light with other people by sharing god's word and by being an example for other people and this brings us to our christ connection you guys Really good job. I know it's a little bit long. There's a lot to cover today. This is our Christ connection for today. Right? Jesus taught people what it meant to follow him, and he taught people on how they should live. People who trust in Jesus live to honor God and to show others what God's kingdom is like. Let's go ahead and pray together. Again. Put your hands together. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I'll answer your question after we pray, okay? Okay, go ahead and use the restroom then. Sorry about that. Let's pray. Jesus, today we learned about the Beatitudes and the characteristics of people who uh, are your followers. And we pray that you would help us because you tell us to be perfect, just like God is perfect. And we know that that's something that we can't do on our own. We pray that you would uh, help us to rely on you, that you would uh, help us to uh, be humble through your Holy Spirit teaching us and training us. Please help us to love other people, to show kindness and mercy to others. We pray that you would help us to be the salt and light of the earth so that we can be uh, examples to other people, so that others might know your love, God, through the way, through our character and the way that we behave. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen.